great if we split the difference of the two clocks. We're at 1.30. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, welcome. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Ann Phibbs, Director of Education in the Office for Equity and Diversity. Welcome to <clears throat> excuse me, the Animal-Human Connection, Clarifying the Roles of Service, Emotional Support, and Therapy Animals, our seventh and final conversation this year in the Office for Equity and Diversity's Critical Conversations about Diversity and Justice series. The Critical Conversation series is co-sponsored by the University Libraries. My colleague in the back, Jody Gray, is responsible for creating a list of further academic resources on each of our Critical Conversation topics, which you can link to on our Critical Conversations webpage. This is our third year of offering these conversations, and we're excited to, continuing, to continue offering live streaming so that you can watch via our website in real time or at a later date, since they will be archived on the web page. We've also added an opportunity for you to provide feedback on this series. If you signed in, we will uh, email you a link to an online evaluation, or you can access that link on our web page as well. As with all of our conversations, we'll start with some discussion among our panelists and moderator, and then we'll move out to the audience for some Q&A. I'm pleased to introduce our moderator for today's conversation, my colleague, Donna Johnson. As director of the Disability Resource Center at the University of Minnesota, Donna Johnson oversees services for more than 2,300 graduate, professional, and undergraduate students with disabilities as well as services for more than 2,600 faculty and staff with disabilities and medical conditions. Since assuming the role of director in 2009, Ms. Johnson has led the strategic planning effort for one of the largest disability services offices in the nation. Ms. Johnson is a former senior research fellow for the Institute on Community Integration. In that role, she co-led the development of the National Alliance for Secondary Education and Transition, NASET, and facilitated the development of its transition toolkit. Co-led the National Leadership Summits with representatives from 50 states and U.S. territories, managed capacity building institutes and national teleconferences, and facilitated the U.S. Department of Education's exiting community of practice. Prior to her work with ICI, Ms. Johnson served as Assistant Director for Disability Services, that's back when it was called Disability Services, <laughs> at the University of Minnesota, where she led the development and implementation of projects funded by the U.S. Department of Education. She is a frequent presenter at national and state conferences, including the AHEAD Conference on numerous occasions. Ms. Johnson holds an MA degree in Industrial Relations from here at the University of Minnesota and an MS degree in Counseling Psychology for State Clouds State University, excuse me, got that out. Please welcome our moderator, Donna Johnson. Hi. Thanks, everyone, for coming for this very important topic. I am very, very pleased to announce to you our panelists for today. And so what I'd like you to do as I introduce you, just raise your hand or let people know that you are the person that I'm referring to. So the first panelist in alphabetical order is Eileen Bowen. And Eileen is a co-founder of Helping Paws, a nonprofit organization that provides service dogs to individuals with physical disabilities, um, other than people who have loss of vision or loss of hearing. In addition, Helping Paws places service dogs with veterans who are affected by post-traumatic stress disorder. Helping Paws was initially a pilot program at SunChair at the University of Minnesota, and Dr. R.K. Anderson was actively involved in the formation of Helping Paws. Eileen's experience includes over 27 years of working with people with disabilities and their service dog partners. She is currently director of, the, of programs for Helping Paws. Helping Paws is an accredited member of the Assistance Dogs International, a coalition of assistance dog providers. Eileen serves on the Assistance Dog International Committee and conducts accreditation surveys of member organizations in North America. So please welcome Eileen. Next we have Susan O'Connor Vaughn. Susan is an associate professor in the Center for Children with Special Health Needs, University of Minnesota School of Nursing. 
In addition, in 2014, she was named Director of Graduate Studies in the Center for Spirituality and Healing. Susan teaches courses addressing the care of children with chronic health conditions, pediatric pain, palliative care, ethics, and spiritual care. Susan has conducted research addressing preparation for painful procedures, web-based educational programs for adolescents undergoing cancer treatment, and spiritual care. Susan served as expert faculty on the Minnesota Health Net Palliative Care Initiative funded by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. She began her work with animal assisted therapy in 1989. Her miniature schnauzer Libby was the first therapy dog for Alina Hospice and Home Care. So please welcome Susan. <laughs> Next we have Pia Sass. Pia is originally from Chicago but came to the University of Minnesota for law school back in 1989. Pia was hit by a car in 2004 and has been medically retired from the Hennepin County Public Defender's Office since then. When she was hit, Pia was in a coma for several months and then um, has relearned to move and walk for several years in her recovery. Pia is here to share her experiences overcoming her disabilities with the help of a service animal. So please welcome Pia. And last but not least is Jay Wilson. And Jay has worked as a clinical social worker, an interfaith chaplain, and advocate in disability communities. He currently works as an access consultant in student access in the Disability Resource Center on our campus. As a disabled person who has partnered with a service dog for six years, he has experience in public and professional roles educating people about the rights and responsibilities of working with service, emotional support, and therapy animals. So please welcome Jay. So we thought it was important to kind of set the stage for this critical conversation. And so I've asked Susan to share with us, historically, why has there been such a strong bond between humans and animals? And the Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for taking time out of this beautiful day when you could be out with nature and animals and come spend time with us. So thank you very much. It's an honor to be here. I was asked to set the stage, and I have about a three-hour lecture. <laughs> <laughs> but I've condensed it down to just a few minutes, so hold on to your hats. <laughs> but it... Our relationship in terms of animal-human connection started many, 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 many centuries ago. Humans and animals have had a complex relationship. They have served as sources of food, clothing, transportation, protection, a variety of different uh, uh, things that they did for us. Some of the world's oldest known paintings depict animals drawn on a cave in rural France estimated over 30,000 years ago, with more than 300 animal images giving testimony to the power and the symbolism of animals and what they held in terms of the lives of those people at that time. Some of the oldest buildings in Turkey, 20 sacred temples, show drawings of lions, fox, birds, snakes, horses, now the purpose of these drawings remain unknown, yet it shows the importance of those animals in the lives of the people at that time. The actual discovery of the therapeutic value of having animals has really been lost to history. We cannot trace back to the exact time or moment that that kitty or that puppy or that chicken or that bird or that bunny helped someone feel better. But over the years, some animals have been domesticated for many tasks well beyond food and being livestock. 
this domestication occurred around the world and across cultures. Now there have been many recorded instances of animals, real animals, not just drawings, being therapeutic for humans. Some of the earliest date back to uh, 9th century Belgium, where citizens provided care for people with disabilities. They included animals, birds, uh, as part of what they called nature therapy for these persons. It was part of the team in caring for them, and that's the ninth century. There were other uh, writings from a saint in the 14th century about a dog that was domesticated who brought food scraps to him, who licked his wounds that resulted from the bubonic plague and helped him heal and survive. More recently in the 1790s at a retreat in York, England, an experimental Quaker institution was established for emotionally disturbed persons, as they called it. Each patient was given rabbits and poultry to care for, and this really helped boost their self-esteem and their reason for living, and that was in the 1790s. Now, being a nurse, I cannot leave out Florence Nightingale, who in the 1860s observed that small animals are often excellent companions for the sick, especially those people living with long-term chronic illnesses. So many of the health benefits became apparent over the decades, and that science has really, really developed in examining this connection between the animal and the human. To the point, if we fast forward to uh, the NIH back in the uh, 1980s, ha convening a workshop on the health benefits of animals in a patient's life. So it's, you know, many wonder why is it that animals, poultry, have such a wonderful um, effect on, on, on persons. So, um, but study data finds over the past decades, the science shows us that pets, not only therapy or service animals, but pets in the lives of healthy individuals fill a void in people's lives. Who can't resist coming home to a loving cat or a dog or a chicken? Who can't help their unconditional love? They never criticize you, right? They always listen. Animals help decrease loneliness and help stimulate conversation. They never talk back. Well, maybe bark, but <laughs> <laughs> many say that um, these um, animals really help create that balance between the mind, body, and spiritual being. Uh, and many say that it gives them hope and a reason to live. So the science is advancing. There's, we have a long way to go, and I'll talk a little bit more about the research and where we are in the research in terms of that animal-human connection. But just kind of wanted to set the stage that it's been a long history and a very interesting history. Uh, in terms of our connection with, with animals. Okay. Thank you, Susan. So Eileen, set the stage for us. And what's the difference between a service animal, an emotional support animal, and a therapy animal? Because I think we get confused. Thank you. I'm glad to be here today. Um, I think that when you look at definitions, it depends upon where you're looking for the definition. And so I'm going to give you some definitions. And even amongst us here, we all may have different interpretations of these definitions. So I'm going to start out with the service animal definition. And that's taken from the Americans with Disabilities Act, which was changed in 2010. And that these changes went into effect in 2011. And they specifically say that a service animal is defined as a dog that's individually trained to do work or perform tasks for people with disabilities. And that do work or perform tasks is a very important part of that for those of us 
within the industry. So that would be dogs that help people that have a physical disability, such as a spinal cord injury. The dog opens doors, picks up items. It could be a person that is blind. It could be a person that has a hearing loss. It could be a, a person that has post-traumatic stress disorder. It could be someone that has seizures. Um, the important thing is that the dog, the task that the dog does must be directly related to the person's disability. Under the ADA, they say that a dog's whose sole function is to provide comfort or emotional support do not qualify as service dogs or animals under the ADA, except for a couple of, of places. One would be the Fair Housing Act. The Fair Housing Act specifically allows emotional support animals, and also the Air Carrier Act specifically al allows emotional support a animals. So then if you go to emotional support animal, that is defined, and this definition is from Wikipedia, so you know, you might have a different de definition. Uh, is a companion animal which provides therapeutic benefit such as alleviating or negating some symptoms of the disability to an individual with a mental or psychiatric disability. To be afforded protection under a United States federal law, a person must meet the federal def definition of disability and must have a note from a physician or other medical professional stating that the person has a disability and that the emotional support animal provides a benefit for the individual with the disability. An animal does not need specific training to become an emotional support um, animal. And so that's the difference between a service dog and an emotional support is that service dog has to be able to perform tasks and emotional support does not necessarily need specific training. Then you come to the therapy animal, and again, different um, interpretations depending upon how you utilize a dog. So I would probably say that the initial parts I would consider with therapy animals would be animal-assisted activities. And most of us know of dogs that are used doing visitation in nursing homes or hospitals. That would be animal-assisted activities. Then you have animal-assisted therapy. And in my interpretation of that, that would be a dog that is working with someone, most likely a professional, or it could be directed by a professional, and it's goal-related, that there are specific goals in mind in using that. I would probably think that the trend within the industry is to be using animals in what's called now animal-assisted in intervention. And so animal-assisted intervention is also goal-related, but it's a wider use of animals. Um, it could be using a, an animal in a facility. It could be using an animal in a courtroom. It could be using an animal in hospice care. So there's a lot of different types of things, physical therapy, using an animal, goal-directed. But basically, in, in that type of work, there has to be a professional working with the animal and that there is a goal that you're going to reach with that. And records are kept regarding those goals. Mm -hmm. So that's just kind of a brief view. Thank you, Eileen. Um, if anybody's interested and didn't pick one up, we did a definition sheet of service animals and emotional support animals. And the definitions that we took on this are from the Americans with Disabilities Act fact page and the Housing and Urban Development Fair Housing Act. And so you can find more information. The websites are on the bottom of the sheet. So make sure to pick one up if you didn't get one and you want one. So with that, I'm going to start with Jay and ask you to start, Jay, by describe your experience with service, emotional support, and or therapy animals from a professional and or personal perspective. Tell the audience specifically what type of animal you work with and what it means to you or the clients or patients or students that you work with um, to work with this type of animal. I, um 
personally, I have worked with um, a soft-coated Wheaton Terrier named Frida. She's very sleepy today, so she's um, under my chair, but we probably won't see much of her. Um, I've worked with her for six years. I um, train her with the help of um, a private trainer that has a program where they t taught me how to train her. And then I took that knowledge, practiced, um, and came back and did some additional training um, and some testing to verify she was at the level where she was ready to be in public. Um, I, at that time, I was living in San Francisco, um, where boundaries around people and animals are very different than Minnesota, um, and had access challenges where I would go into a business and somebody would inform me that I wasn't allowed to bring my pet in like daily, whereas in Minnesota it happens, you know, maybe once a year. Um, uh, and professionally, I've worked um, with people um, that were homeless in San Francisco um, and with people with a variety of disabilities in Minnesota that were or were interested in partnering with um, service animals or um, interested in exploring if an emotional support animal in their housing might be appropriate and walking through those steps of that discernment. Um, to help them to decide if that was appropriate and access the resources needed to get there, if so. Okay. Yeah, do you want to go next? Sure. Hello. Um, I'm not going to get the question entirely perfect, but I was disabled in 2004. Got out of the wheelchair probably sometime in 2006. Was still using the walker when I got the dog, but less so. This is my imaginary assistant's dog. His name is Elby, and he's at home because I no longer need him to get to where I'm going. And he's so out of training that he would really misbehave in here. Not, not horribly, but he he's a standard poodle, so he's about this big. And I strap him up with this, what's called, I think it's called a pulling harness. And I got the idea from Don Falk, who used to train with helping paws. And although at the time she wasn't working with assist animals, I had emailed her and asked her if where I could find one of those harnesses that blind people use. I was having difficulty maintaining upright, and I couldn't find upright with a cane. And that was before I realized that I could use a staff. That worked. Who knew? But so. And the good thing about his dog is they go everywhere with you. They go over bumps and up and down much better than a walker. So she said she contacted Jean, who's one of those people who helped develop the general leader. And Jean had had a stroke, and she was using these pulling harnesses on her German Shepherd. And they were comparable in size to a standard portal. So he literally pulled me around for a couple of years. And the weird thing is that when I'm indoors, I'm fine, which is where all the people are. But I, need, I needed him to get indoors. So I needed to have him in the facility. The training was hard for me because I couldn't figure out which facility to take him to. I'm not employed. And I didn't want to take him to any place that had food, even though the law would allow me to. It just didn't seem fair to you all. So he's not here, but he's here in spirit, and his hair is here. <laughs> Thanks, Pia. How about you, Susan, and the clients or patients you work with? I'll, I'll start out by just telling you that I grew up on a farm in southeast Iowa. So I grew up with 
animals. Um, and, but it was very clear which was the livestock and which were the pets. Mm-hmm. Even though my siblings and I were constantly adopting livestock to be pets. We would say, oh, that piglet, it's a bronto. We got, you know, so we, we'd adopt it. Or that little lamb's not going to survive, so we'd adopt it. So we had all these pets that were actually supposed to be livestock, but we kept them. Uh, goats, a turkey, a duck, a lamb. I mean, just a variety of different um, that we saved. <laughs> so I was riding a horse and a goat before I could walk. So animals are just always a part of my life. So when I moved to the big city, of course, couldn't have really a big dog in my little teeny house, in my little teeny backyard. So I decided that I really, really wanted to have a dog that I could do therapy work. And I was really convinced that I needed to do that um, back in 1989. Now, I've been a pediatric nurse for well over 35 years. But back in 1989, my grandmother, who lived on her own farm until she was 96 years old, fell and broke her hip. And she had to go to a senior living facility. She was not happy at all, but she had to. We just could not maintain her at the farm, her own farm anymore. And when she got there for weeks, she would not speak to anyone. No one would speak to her. She was just not happy. About that time, I rescued my first miniature schnauzer, Abby, um, and I decided to take her to the senior living facility. And my grandmother was sitting in the waiting area because she knew I was coming. So I put that little miniature schnauzer on my grandmother's lap, and within a minute, she became a celebrity. My grandmother became the celebrity because of the dog. And so many people surrounded her and talked to her and petted the dog. And I kept thinking, you know what? If this dog can do this for my grandmother, I should be able to do this for other grandmothers and grandfathers and other people. And the dog took that, you know, many people petting her, and and it just she loved it. And so from that time on, my grandmother had a, a great social network. Everyone talked to her about the dog. When's the dog coming back? What kind of breed is that dog? And does it shed? And where are they from? And all this. And when's your granddaughter coming back? <laughs> so, <laughs> so she became quite the celebrity. And I thought, you know, I really need to do this. Now, at that time, back in the late 80s, um, the therapy dog uh, world in the Twin Cities wasn't as established. I went through the Humane Society, but it was a matter of taking my dog to a veterinarian here at uh, the University of St. Paul campus, did a thorough exam, and uh, kind of roughed up the dog, pulled a tail, ears. Oh, yeah, she's fine. She can be a therapy dog. So <laughs> that was my beginning. And uh, so I had one particular senior facility that I went to every single Friday at 1 p.m., And when I think back, um, what I was doing was animal-assisted activities. Every single Friday at 1 p.m., I would go to this one senior facility. And over weeks, it became very apparent to me by the charge nurse to come and say to me, you know what, there are people getting dressed and getting out of their room and walking down the hall that would never have done this before, never, except to see your dog. So it encouraged them in terms of ambulation to walk down the hall, It encouraged social support. And I would throw out those questions about what kind of pets did you have? And it started the conversation among all the residents about their pets. And then, of course, she would do tricks and, you know, whatever. Somebody wanted to hold her. But really, when I think back, my very first dog really did animal-assisted activities is really what she did. Over time, then, I went on to get my second and third and now fourth miniature schnauzers. They've all been rescues. Uh, Action Jackson is my current one, and uh, he had to do a lunch and learn in the School of Nursing yesterday, so he's home sleeping. (laughs) (laughs) He had many, many people petting him. So, Um, My second dog, and we do have handouts here, uh, Libby, again a rescue. Um, That particular um, dog um, was rescued uh, by actually a veterinarian uh, here at the University of Minnesota. Uh, the dog was going to be put to sleep, euthanized by its family. Uh, the original owner was in her 80s and lived in St. Paul, had never married, and uh, the cousin from California came and said, we don't want to deal with this dog, took the dog to the St. Paul campus because that was the only vet clinic they could find in the documentation and asked this wonderful vet to please put this dog down. Of course, you know, 
unethical to do this to a healthy dog. And uh, this lovely veterinarian called me up on a Friday afternoon and said, are you ready? I said, ready for what? Ready for your next schnauzer. He knew my first one had died. And I said, oh, no, 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 my heart's still broken. It's only been six months. I just can't do that. I'm just not ready for another schnauzer. I just can't. I'm still grieving. He goes, well, you know, I'm going to be away for the weekend. Can you just take her for the weekend? (laughs) What a brilliant man. (laughs) He does receive a donation for his center every single year from me. (laughs) I won't name him. (laughs) Uh, So I said, oh, I'll just try for the weekend. So I go and I pick up Libby, and she's like, driving Miss Daisy home. She sits in the back. She doesn't bark. She sits there very politely. She comes into the house. She doesn't get on any furniture. She just sits at my feet. I thought, oh my goodness. Within about an hour, I knew I had to adopt this dog. Well, I come to find out, he told me about her owner. Her owner, as I said, was in her 80s. And she had ended up in a wheelchair and had a walker. And so this dog was so comfortable around, you know, hospital equipment. That was just furniture to her. So I took her on through the Humane Society and went through the therapy dog program. And she just breezed right through. So she was the very first therapy dog for Alina Hospice. And so for five years, um, uh, she was the therapy dog. Uh, Now there are others. Uh, She was the pilot project. uh, And um, many wonderful stories of her um, with um, persons who who were dying. So... Thank you, Susan. How about you, Eileen? Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about Helping Paws and what we do and how we do that. So we train service dogs for people with physical disabilities and also for veterans that are affected by post-traumatic stress disorder. And how we get there is a little different than some large organizations. So we have a breeding program that consists of Golden Retrievers and Labrador Retrievers. And we use those two breeds specifically because for what we've, for our clients, we've found that they have that natural ability to retrieve, that they like people, they're very friendly, um, and they're an appropriate size. And so our dogs produce the dogs that go into training. And then the next thing that's a little unique is that we have foster home trainers that actually volunteer to have those dogs for two and a half years. That means that they come to Helping Paws every week and we show them how to train the dogs. And the benefit to the dogs is that the dogs never have to be in a kennel facility. And so they go right from being trained by the foster home trainer to going with the person that's going to receive them. So we're really fortunate in Minnesota to have people that are so willing to give up their time. And it does become kind of like a family. And the friendships really abound amongst the foster homes because they're all going through that same experience. And, you know, there's highs and lows (laughs) because it's not so easy to train a service dog. Not every dog is meant to be a service dog. In order to achieve that goal, the dog has to be physically sound. It has to have the temperament that can handle being in a room like this with a lot of people and then going outside to somewhere that's a little more quiet or to a twins game. So there's all those different things that a dog may encounter in a day, and that's not the right career for every dog. Um, in addition, people that apply to for a service dog have to go through a process. So there's an interview process um, where we interview them in their home. And then when we have a match for them, and when we match dogs, we match people and dogs. So they'll come in and work with several different dogs to see what's the right dog for them, what's the right match. And we have their input, and then we have our our input from our experience. And once we received a match, then they go through what we call team training, which is three weeks of training, learning how to care for the dog, both physically um, and also mentally, and learning all the words that the dogs know, because when you come in, the dog is going to be smarter than you are, because it knows all these things. So you have to learn how to work with the dog. And then we also do field trips, where you go out in public and work with the dog. After that, the dog moves in with you, and then we provide follow-up for the life of the dog. And we feel that is really important for our graduates, that they have that support, 
that we're just a phone call away that they can call and ask if they have any problems or any questions and we, we can go out and troubleshoot on that. I think for, for someone that um, receives a service dog, what, what we're trying to achieve is an independence and that you can do things without having to ask somebody else to do it for you. And so if you drop a pencil on the floor, your dog can pick it up. You don't have to ask someone else to come over and, and do it. So it gives you freedom and independence, and it also becomes a partnership. And I think that's really, really important because you and your service dog are a team. You're working together. You're facing life's challenges together, and you're really true partners. Um, and that's really evident when there is the loss of, of a service dog. And so I, I think that some of my most meaningful times have been when I've been there for that saying goodbyes part of, of the life, and that it really is treasured and precious moments. Thank you. To start with you for the next question, um, you were nodding your head, and I think you have some responses to Eileen. But um, in addition to thinking about what Eileen said, what would you say are the greatest misperceptions of service animals, emotional support animals, or therapy animals? Sure. Um, in general, I would say that. Um, because we have this connection with animals that it's really easy for people to project what they're thinking or feeling all over the animal and the person they're working with. Um, so, um, as an example, uh, Frida that I work with um, has eyes that many people think look sad and so we'll be out in public, she'll be happy, her tail will be wagging, we'll be moving through the world doing what we need to do, and I will hear people commenting about how sad she must be and how horrible it must be for her to be trapped working this way, and I'm like, she's super happy, we're moving towards supper right now. She <laughs> is, this is what she looks like when she's happy. Um, and that's one thing, but then there's a piece of what happens that's also about ableism or um, discrimination or stereotypes about people with disabilities and one of the ways that piece comes in is this um, assumption or entitlement that people feel they have to immediately know whether or not somebody has a disability what kind it is and intimate details about what our body and brain how our bodies and brains work and um, I name that piece as ableism because I think it's really important to um, talk about that that power and oppression piece um, when, whenever we're talking about disabled people um, and that that gets bigger when there's other pieces with that so what it's like to move in the world as a white person with a service dog is different um, people generally assume in most contexts that what I'm doing is following the law um, at least in Minnesota um, but that's not everybody's experience. That's not the experience when you're also experiencing racism, when the assumptions that you might not be following the law. Um, so all of those pieces pile up to make um, moving through the world more difficult. Um, I think another misperception sometimes is um, just around um, people feeling the freedom to or desire to interact with the service dogs in sometimes very unhelpful ways. Um, <laughs> uh, it's not uncommon that um, the other day I was walking in Kaufman with a coworker. We had just given a presentation and we're walking down the stairs, which actually for me requires a lot of um, concentration on coordinating to not run into the other person or fall down the stairs or um, step on Frida or all of those things. and somebody yells puppy and starts moving towards us which is a whole nother thing to coordinate and um, uh, so there's that kind of impulsive thing that happens which is understandable it, it's understandable that with the connections we have with animals that that happens sometimes um, but um, at the same time 
educating ourselves about what it means to be with an animal in public, what boundaries are around that, um, and um, having those conversations is really important. And I try to do that when I have enough energy and time and I'm not crossing the street when people sometimes ask. So. Okay. Thanks, Jay. How about you, Pia? Um, thank you. Um, I don't have a list of very long misperceptions people have of my animal. Um, uh, they do come up and want to play with your anim my animal as if it's a pet. And I've been able to dissuade them by asking, just saying he's on duty. And as you saw, I have him in a harness. So when he's not in the harness, I do let him meet people. But when he's in the harness, I expect other behavior from him, which helps me in my relationship with him. But people don't know that. But being able to indicate that he's on duty, those words have worked here, which is nice. Um, the, the most fear infuriating experience that I've had as you saw with the harness, it does have a um, thing on it that says service animal or something like that. I bought it off the web. You can buy this off the web. I tried to get my dog to pass a therapy dog test. He failed. <laughs> I'm a run trainer, and he just couldn't deal with some of the leave your animal requirements. And so I wanted to be able to take him in the facilities. I smacked the decal on him. And what that means is he's legally allowed to go in, but he's not insured. My house insurance covers him, luckily. If he bites anyone, God forbid. So for me, as a disabled person, having an animal that helps me with my disability, smacking that sticker on his harness, helps me and the community know that I use him, that he sometimes goes on service. Now, I know that there are friends who have learned that I've done this, and they've known that they, they've smacked that damn thing on their dog, and taken their dog where legally they're allowed to if it's a service dog. Well, that's outrageous. So I'm not asking for more regulation and I probably should do a better job confronting my friends but that's the most inappropriate thing I've been able to think of okay. so far. Eileen? And I'm going to expand on that because that, that really industry-wise is the biggest difficulty that we see right now is that people are representing dogs as service dogs that are not um, an example is last Saturday we were at, I had a group of, of 10 graduates at Southdale Mall and we were doing the ADI public access test which our graduates have to take within six months of receiving their dog and then when the dog is five years old and the dog is 10 years old. And so um, anyone can buy a pack um, and anyone can buy a a label that says service dog and, and have their dog in public. And um, our graduates, you know, work really hard to make sure that their dogs are in, appropriate in public. And I had graduates coming from North Dakota and Wisconsin and um, all over to make sure that they, their dogs are appropriate. And I'm just finishing up the test with um, someone and we're doing the part where the, you, the dog has to leave food that's on the table and you drop the food on the floor. And I look into the restaurant that is right next door to us and I see someone sitting at a table looking at his phone and then I look and there's a small breed of dog with a pack on dragging a leash, wandering the restaurant, eating food on the floor. And it was like such a combination of the good and the bad. And so our graduate goes in and um, he said, you know, I'm going to go and say something to him. 
and he uses a chair, so his disability is pretty obvious. And he went up to the person and said, you, you know, to the effect that you're kind of making it look bad for all of us here. And the person totally ignored it and went up to the manager and said to the manager, he's, he's bothering me. And the manager said, oh, the dog's so cute. And so it's those type of situations that are just totally frustrating when you're trying to do the right thing and have dogs be appropriate in public places so that we don't lose those rights. Um, so that's something that is really industry-wise something that, that's going on now. Okay, thank you. Susan, I see you nodding, so you're yeah. ready for the yeah. phone. I just want to clarify the extensive training not only uh, the service dogs have, but you know, in, in doing therapy work, the human goes through extensive training too, and we spend a lot of time doing education to the public. Because when my dog is working, my dog's not a service dog, so I do a lot of education about the fact that, you know, my dog is not federally protected. This is a therapy dog. Let me explain what a therapy dog's all about. So we go and we do our work first before we ever play. So when we go into senior facilities, a lot of times the charge nurses go, we have treats, we have treats. No, my dog is working right now. We have a patient to see, we have a client to see, whatever, and we will come back and spend time with you. Most often it's the staff that needs <laughs> time with the dog, and so the staff will all congregate around. Uh, and that's A-OK, -okay, because that's really animal-assisted activity at the end, which my dog loves. But it's very important that we have our primary goal is to visit that patient in hospice first. That's our job, and we talk about that. With um, therapy dog training, you know, selecting that animal is very, very important. You know, many people think that any animal can be a service dog or a therapy dog, and it's really extensive screening and training uh, determine these dogs. It requires that the human and the animal work together as a team. So I go through all that training, all that education. No one else can take my dog to see a patient, only me, right? And I can't take anybody else's dog. We are a team. And really to provide that safe and effective therapy or activities that we're doing, we really have to abide by the standards of that organization, be it Therapy Dogs International, Pet Partners, Delta Society, whatever it is, we have to abide by their standards. Some of the most important things are is the fact that we need to demonstrate appropriate treatment of our animals and of the humans that we visit that we need to use appropriate social skills in all, all times. So I'm a nurse, so hopefully I'm using therapeutic communication at all times. <laughs> Acting as that animal's advocate constantly. I'm not going to put my dog, whatever uh, uh, animal, chicken, whatever, bunny, in a situation where that animal could be harmed. Never. And so I'm constantly that advocate for that dog. Really reading the animal's cues constantly. Is the dog exhausted, time to go home? I want to make sure I'm providing ethical treatment for my dog. I'm not going to visit 10 people one day because it's emotionally draining for the dog. You can see that they really get tired. So I'm really reading the dog's cues. Is it, you know, are they yawning? Are they panting? Time to go home and really maintaining confidentiality. So I'm going through the uh, training through Alina Hospice. It was two full days, and Libby, the first Alina Hospice dog, did spend two full days in training. She was really good when it came to HIPAA, really good in terms <laughs> of confidentiality, <laughs> because we did have to document every single visit according to Medicare Hospice Benefit. We had to document, so I did document for her. I did the writing for her. She could take a nap. <laughs> so it's really important that people know we go through extensive training. And Libby, for example, after she went through, first of all, passing the Canine Good Citizen exam, which is the mandatory obedience training before dogs go into therapy dog training, then extensive uh, months of therapy dog training, depending on your dog, how quick learner they are. And then it's time for evaluation. So when... Um, 
Libby went through the evaluation process, which took about 45 minutes. Therapy Dogs International that I was working with at the time flew out an evaluator from uh, New Jersey out to the Humane Society, and they did evaluations for one full Sunday. There were nine dogs that were evaluated, two passed. Libby and a retired canine police dog from St. Paul, Ramsey County. Now that dog, Dallas was his name, came right after me as we were finishing up our paperwork and Dallas was still sniffing people. <laughs> and his owner said, Dallas, you're retired from the police department. <laughs> you're here just for loving. <laughs> so anyway, just um, some of the misconceptions about the fact that we are there really to work and to work with patients and clients, and then we can have fun with the staff and help decrease their stress too. I'm going to ask you quickly because we want to get to audience questions. In one or two sentences, what do you think are the greatest benefits for you personally or for the people that you work with to have access to a service animal, emotional support animal, or therapy animal? And I'm going to start with you, Jay. Um, for me personally, um, my dog is trained to do medical alert and also some mobility, getting around in crowds tasks. And um, having that extra backup to make sure that I'm safe in public and also can um, catch potential issues before needing assistance is very helpful in being able to navigate the world and do the work I do. and. Um, I uh, work with other people. Um, for other people that I've worked with that have worked with service animals, it's really been very personal what the particular benefit has been depending on what the impacts of their disabilities and what barriers they're facing are. Um, and um, that's always something important to weigh together with the amount of time and energy and effort that goes into training and continuing training and um, visibility in public and all of those pieces. Thank you. Um, I probably am going to go back to the independence part of it for our clients. And um, I think that it, it, it's especially meaningful as we begin the program for our veterans that have post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, I can see the difference that having a dog has made for them. And then for me personally, I guess I'm probably very lucky because I get to do that whole process that I get to see the dogs when they're born, I get to watch them go through training, I get to see them matched with someone, and then I get to be there sometimes when they leave us too. So I've got that whole whole big picture. So I'm probably one of the luckiest people in the world because I get to work with people and animals all the time. Susan? I would say seeing the positive health benefits of patients, especially doing animal-assisted therapy or interventions. So, for example, um, if we're visiting a patient who's had a CVA stroke on one side, we will sit next to that um, patient. <laughs> And uh, instead of doing um, physical therapy, which might seem boring to that patient, I'll have that patient, you know, pet the dog with that affected side. And that's much more fun than doing physical therapy. They say, oh, I'd rather pet your dog and use that affected side. Or, you know, could you help me walk the dog down to the nurse's desk? Oh, sure, I'll help you walk the dog and actually get up and ambulate. Um, so seeing those positive outcomes, and, and, sp and especially in persons who don't want to do their physical therapy or ambulate uh, has always been just so wonderful for me to see that and then to be able to document that positive uh, steps every single week. So, yeah. And Pia. Thank you. Um, I guess for me, the most everybody wants to take care of something. And that's been follows the independence during the time, during the winters in the dark. Okay. Thank you. So now it's your turn. Does anyone have questions? I see Nancy in the back. Anne will run the mic to you. And I just want to be clear that we want everyone to speak into the microphone. Aware of a 
person who is dealing with PTSD, who is not a veteran, and is having a very hard time locating a dog. Um, so one, I'd, I'd like information if you can share about how to advise or refer this person, and then, and then, so I've got, I'm trying to condense it to two questions. So there's that one, and then secondly, perhaps one of you could talk to, uh, maybe this person would benefit from an emotional support dog with her PTSD, and if so, what resources are out there to help train the dog and the individual? Okay. That seems like it might be a question for Eileen. It's a hard one because um, our organization thought about, you know, going into, into the PTSD route for a, a number of years before we actually did. And so we looked at the veterans as the, the pressing need at this time and that that was a way that we could make a, an impact. And so we do limit to only veterans. Um, and we also looked at did we have the resources within our organization to do the follow-up um, because we're dealing with mental health issues and someone, for example, that just has a background in dog training you know, they, they need more than that. We, we needed to have the staff to be able to, to do the follow-up. So I, I think that, and the other thing I think that for someone that's looking at a dog to assist with PTSD is that there's the pro and the con. The pro is that the dog helps you in public places by diverting attention or it um, serves as a barrier to people, it makes you it, feel more calm, but it also attracts more attention. For someone that has anxiety issues, that is, can be really difficult in public. So there's that pro and that con. So for someone that um, is looking at the dog to assist with PTSD, I would be really defining what do I want? What do I want to achieve by having this dog? How important is it for me to have this dog in public locations? What's the primary need that I want the dog to have to f serve as, as a function? And then I probably would investigate and look around. Um, Assistance Dogs International is the organization that we belong to and see if you can find any organizations that train for that for people other than veterans. And then I also would look around private trainers and see if you can find somebody in the local area um, that does pri private training. And I would probably look at um, APDT, which is, um, I can't remember what it stands for right now, but it's an organization of private tra of people that do dog training. Um, also to add as a resource, um, Psychiatric Service Dog Partners has um, is an uh, organization of people with psychiatric disabilities that have partnered with service dogs. That has a lot of really good information about what are some of the kinds of tasks that can be trained for around um, any type of mental health condition and what are the pros and cons and what are the realities of needing to do training, what are resources for doing that. So that's another resource. Um, one of the um, inequities about working with service dogs is that there is very, very little help for funding. Um, the Veterans Administration is really the only organization that I know of that provides any funding directly for service dogs, um, so that's another reality. Okay. Next question. That actually was leading into what my question was. I wanted to know more about the affordability of owning a service dog and or training a service dog. Um, so if you're talking about fees involved in applying for a service dog, varies. Um, in our organization, it's a $50 application fee, $300 equipment fee. And then 
that's all the fees that are involved. Uh, the dogs are valued at thirty to thirty-five thousand dollars. We also have an Alpha Gator Fund for any dogs that have some health issues and you financially cannot afford that. I have seen people pay twenty to thirty thousand dollars for dogs and then receive no follow-up. So I, I think it's always a buyer beware type of situation. And um, so, Pia, did you have something? I made my pet a service dog, so I um, purchased a pet poodle and took him through regular obedience training and fashioned what kind of help I needed. So there were those expenses. There were some test attempts and those expenses, but the, here, the reason my dog is a million dollar poodle now is because he's since been he broke his leg, he ran away, but then he's since been diagnosed with a stress disease called Addison's, and to my good fortune, it just takes a monthly shot and a daily pill to get him fine, but that stuff adds up. So there's the initial cost, but then there's possible health consequences. Um, there's a question over here, Ann. Yep. Has there been any research that would show if a, a service dog or a therapy, therapy dog could help in chemical dependency? Okay, that sounds like that might be a Susan question. Um, well, uh, I would say in terms of um, some of the social support, yes. Specifically chemical dependency, actually I have a study and I'll meet with you right after to show you because I've done extensive literature reviews, but in general in terms of the research, most of the research in terms of therapy dogs has focused on cardiovascular disease, seizure disorders, dementia, Alzheimer's, and pain management. That's where the major focus but in terms of the research in general, I will tell you though that majority of the research uses small sample sizes just because of the logistics of actually conducting these studies. Many lack a control group or comparison group. So you have that, that dog or the cat or the bunny or whatever, so there you go, you have that wonderful benefit from that particular animal. Um, and the other thing that's really been debated in terms of the state of the science is what we would call the dose. Was it a one-time visit postoperatively by this dog that came and helped decrease the analgesic use because of this dog there? Or how often should that dog visit or that cat visit? So in terms of the research, we have a long ways to go, but the great thing about the research and the science behind looking at therapy dogs and service dogs is now they're accepted to be in a healthcare system and that we can conduct the research. When I started out, you could not bring a dog or cat or whatever animal into the healthcare system. And being a nurse, I had the insider view, right? So as a pediatric nurse many years ago, I was one of those accomplices that did sneak in a Shetland pony on a Saturday night, <laughs> knowing farewell I could be fired, right? But this little eight-year-old was dying, and she wanted her pony there. And so we waited till we knew there was a supervisor that would trust us, and we sneaked that Shetland pony into the dirty utility room. But if you could have seen her face, it was worth being fired. I wasn't fired, but <laughs> same with a goat. One time we sneaked a goat in. <laughs> So those are things that we did as pediatric nurses, knowing these children wanted so much to have their pet come from home. Uh, now, the Great Dane was harder to sneak in. <laughs> I had to kind of dress that dog up. No, actually, we took the patient outside to see the dog. So, but the great thing about the research is now they're accepted to be in the health setting or in a f senior facility, and we can actually start doing more and more of the research in larger sample sizes. So, um, but I'll meet with you in, in just a, a second here. That's my husband's business, so I know a little bit about that area. So, okay. 
But there's a question in the back here. Okay, so I know um, emotional support uh, animal fraud is kind of growing to be a bigger thing, people acquiring certificates on the internet and um, not seeing a doctor um, for this kind of thing. Is there something we should be doing about this or, or is this a problem um, that, yeah, we should be talking about? Anyone want to take that question? <laughs> um, I think that public awareness is really important. Um, I think that we always have to be aware of people's individual rights. And so um, knowing what you can ask and what you can't ask are important. Um, within the service dog industry or the assistance dog industry, um, they are working trying to make our congressman more aware that legislation probably is going to happen at some point um, because it's becoming, you know, it, there was two weeks ago there was an article in the USA about someone bringing a pig on board a, a plane and the pig was incontinent and, and all that. So, you know, people are pushing uh, on things and, you know, unfortunately that's going to lead to more legislation is probably what, where that is going to go from my, from my viewpoint. Um, around emotional support animals in particular, um, because there's actually not a lot of legal guidance, there's the HUD rulings about, or the HUD laws about um, specifically in housing, but that's one place, and there's an Air Carrier Act that covers in the airplane, and then there's everywhere else, right? And so there's a lot of questions right now legally that's, that are sort of being worked out in between those laws about what rights are to begin with and then what that means. Um, in general, I mean, I agree that education about, in particular, the thing that I, I have seen as particularly problematic is not understanding the responsibilities around um, if you're going to be with an animal in public, whatever level of training it has had, um, what it means to be safe and appropriate, and um, particularly when other animals might be around, um, is a, something to be educating each other about, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay, Laura has a question. Uh, hi, I just, I get a question kind of relating to that. Um, you know, I heard, I read an article from my own school that I got my dog from two weeks ago, just after this graduate got home with her dog. Um, they were attacked in a convenience store in Michigan, where she lives, and, uh, I'm sorry, it was Utah, and um, her dog's ear was torn up, you know, he's out of commission for two weeks, which, you know, I have a dog and I know what that would be like to not have him for two weeks. Not only that, but, you know, it's dangerous to his career, you know, if he's a bounce back kind of dog, he could be fine, but he could never work again. And I think that that's kind of the biggest thing, the biggest issue people have with people who may not have any sort of disability, but who just want to bring their pet with them. And they, you know, what we've been talking about just tagging this patch on their dog's coat. I, I saw a website that the title of the website was Take Your Dog Anywhere. Anyway, my question is, what comes up a lot in these discussions is certifications and there's a big divide between members in the service dog community who think we shouldn't have any and those that think we should. And I just wanted to know what you guys thought about that, of getting some sort of national-wide like certification ID card that you could carry with you. So, okay. Anyone want to start with that question? I think there are advantages and disadvantages towards moving towards that, um, regardless of whether or not there may be in the future a national certification, like there's still a lot of responsibility for individuals to make sure that they're keeping up with training, that um, safety continues to be a priority, um, that handling in everyday life is 
safe and appropriate, and I think that national certification could potentially maybe help with some of that sometimes. Um, but there's there's still the issue that there's that one moment in time when you're you're taking the certification exam or when it's going on, and other times other things may be going on. Um, so regardless, um, there's lots of education to do whether or not that happens, I think. I think also you have to look at guide dogs have been around for over 50 years, um, you know, that they have a long history of having access. And then the service dog industry sort of came along. And what you see within the service dog industry is that you see very small organizations to very large organizations. And so that kind of opened it up, I believe, to different ways of doing things. And so that certification, as a member of Assistance Dogs International, we're required to give our graduates a test, that they have to pass the standardized test. Um, the other thing that goes along with that is ownership of, of the dog, which can be a large issue. Some organizations don't transfer ownership to, to the person that has the dog. Um, in Canada, organizations are restricted from passing ownership to the dog because liability-wise, they're always liable for, for the dog, and that's the way the law is written in Canada. So there has to be that, there's also that part of it in, in consideration. So, for example, we pay, transfer ownership after they pass the ADI public access test. Some organizations keep ownership for the life of the dog. And so for persons receiving those, those dogs, that creates issues and discussion. Um, so there's a lot of things that go into certification, ownership, and, and how you run your organization. Anyone else have a comment to add? Okay, more questions for the panel. I have a question if that's okay. Um, so I had a colleague a number, actually it was over 10 years ago, who, and I don't remember why, but was really deathly afraid of dogs. It was a huge issue for her. We used to go walking after lunch, and if she even thought a dog was on the block, it would affect it was definitely affect her emotionally. And then recently I had an experience where I was um, in an event that I was kind of in charge of and uh, I had someone who was using um, a service dog and I also had someone who needed to be in the space who came up and shared with me that she was deathly afraid of dogs. And I found myself trying to navigate both emotional experience, you know, the, the absolute need for that dog to be in the room for the person who needed that dog, and also recognizing that for some people, um, and I was also thinking about allergies and thinking about some of the challenges that come with animals and spaces that they've not typically been in. And I don't want to be insensitive, but, um, when, you know, I when I had that experience, I was like, okay, how do I, we, we ended up navigating it, um, the issue, but I, I I wondered if the folks on the panel had a little more experience and had some thoughts about that. Navigating conflicting access needs is is something that often happens in disability community. Um, less often than might be assumed. I think of two instances in six years, and I spent a lot of time in disability communities. So, um, and it's always figuring out what are what are the priorities? So for me, when I'm working with a student, um, I'll say I work with a service dog, she's in my office, if we need to meet in a different space, I can manage for an hour to do that. Um, and, but other times, you know, we're talking about the particular needs. Um, the tricky piece is that both people have a right to be able to access the space, and so figuring out the problem solving of how that's going to happen is really important. And in terms of um, phobias and PTSD around dogs, one piece of that is that it can be really helpful the more in control and the more um, managed the dog is, can 
for some people, not for all people, but for some people can help to reduce those symptoms. So that's one potential piece of that, but then talking through the specifics of what's needed and what's safe and how to, how to make sure both people can be there. Uh, our graduates have run into this uh, specifically with allergies, and it's always been able to be accommodated um, by where they have the dog, where the person with the allergies is, limiting that contact. So we've always found solutions, and it's always been up to their employer to accommodate those um, situations. Um, the other place that with the, the fear of dogs sometimes happens with our graduates with their personal care attendants that may be fearful of of a dog. And, you know, typically our, our graduate, that's their their staff per se, and so it's up to them to work that out with um, the people that work for them. And just a comment with uh, my therapy dog, I only go where I've been invited, where I've been asked to visit. And so through a line of hospice or whatever program I'm working with, they have specifically contacted me and say, this person wants to spend time with a dog, with a therapy dog. Now, I always call in advance. If I'm going to like a senior living facility or someplace I've never been before, I'll speak to the charge nurse and I'll say, do you have any staff who are scared of dogs? Do you have kind of that sense? You know, because they've seen uh, people bringing in their own pets from home or whatever. Um, and if so, what I always do with my dog is I pick her up, wrap her in the blanket that we use that goes onto the bed before they, you know, line the bed. So pick up the dog, wrap them, wrap them up so you only see a little bit of, so the dog can breathe, you know, and keep them under my arm and go straight to the room where I need to go, right? So there's no possibility of that dog, and it, it wouldn't be wandering on anyway, but um, possibly coming up and sniffing somebody who's scared of dogs. So I always am very sensitive to the staff about um, their fear of dogs. Okay. So. Experience you want to share? Okay. Any other questions for the panel? Someone in the back? I've got a question. It might be more towards Sue. Um, we've been talking, I think, a lot about individual partnerships between uh, particular patients and uh, therapy. And I'm thinking of the university community right now. I've heard of um, some programs where universities have brought in um, animals towards the end of the semester because of the high stress levels towards uh, end depression. Oh, it looks like we have a... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm Tanya Bailey, and I'm the Animal Assisted Interaction Program Specialist here at the University of Minnesota, and the coordinator of the PAUSE program, which stands for Pet Away, Worry, and Stress, and it's held every Wednesday at Boynton Health Service. We've got Boynton folks here in front, and twice a month on the St. Paul campus. I, I want to be clear, I didn't quite understand the question. I heard, I understand you're, you're interested about program, group programs, but can you help me with the question? <laughs> You had talked about small sample sizes with with these testing, and I'm thinking that in this kind of community, it'd be a larger sample size. And I guess the thing is the effectiveness of, let's say, PAUSE program. So um, definitely, the program. Yes, our sample sizes are in the thousands right now, so that's really great. And the other piece too is that we also are doing a year-long study on the program, and so we're. We're getting preliminary data on on the effect of that, and I think it's it's really hard though to compare a group process where you have over two hours. Right now, 150 people that come in, and we have up to eight different animals in the room. It's a very different process than an individual process where it's it's managed and it's. Um, prescriptive and you're looking at very clear goals and objectives. The goal and objective of the PAUSE program is to help reduce student stress and it's meant to be 
recreational. It's meant to be, in, you know, invigorating and enlivening. And yet we do definitely um, have students who will come in and experience um, memories and will share a, way more in depth than they might typically have thought they ever would share in a group process because animals bring those pieces out in us. So we're very sensitive to that. And we're very fortunate also to have it offered in Boynton Health Service where if we do have to make referrals, we are right there in a, in a setting where that can happen. Um, and I'm also a licensed clinical social worker, so I'm also able to be attentive to those, those additional needs should they arise. Does that help? Okay, question in the back. So I was just curious about uh, kind of the length of service, um, <coughs> I guess the amount of time that a, a, a service dog is kind of, I guess, in service. So I know that there was talk that there was kind of the two-year fostering process and then training, and then um, and then the, the dog gets matched and, and then does their service, but is there like kind of like a retirement program for service dogs? Um, I think that there's a difference between a service dog and a guide dog um, because um, the guide dog, and, and perhaps the, I know that there's someone here that does have a guide dog, and I don't know if this is your first dog or your second dog or your third dog, um, but I think that someone that has a guide dog, that that process of retirement may differ a little bit from a service dog. And so, and I'm, I'm, so I'm going to generalize. A guide dog user may retire their dog and someone else adopts that dog. Or they may find a retirement home or their organization may have a retirement program. Within the service dog industry, what I see is that people tend to keep their dog uh, until their dog passes away. And that, again, that's generalizing. Um, our program has helped graduates with dogs that may not be able to do the physical public type of things, but perhaps their dog still serves a function in their home, or they just want to keep their dog as long as they have it. Um, on the other hand, they might need to have, maybe they can't physically manage the dog any longer, and so then we would find a place for that dog to go. And sometimes it's the original foster home um, trainers that take the dog back for the balance of their life. So it's kind of individual. I actually had a question about that for other service dogs. I think you're right in, I'm the one with the guide dog, and he's my third, so he's awesome. Um, yeah, you, you pretty much covered it well. We get the first crack at him when they retire, like we get to keep him. Um, like I've adopted him from my school he's my forever dog and I want to keep him but like you know my last one had to go to California where there were no storms so he would not be scared um, and he's happy he chases the lawnmower <laughs> so I guess my question is regarding like the physical or maybe even mental toll on the dogs because our dogs work hard you know they really do and I think all service dogs work very hard uh, in different ways, but I guess what I was wondering is like for all the panelists in general, is there like a length of time our dogs, if everything goes well, will work you know eight to ten years? It kind of depends on what your lifestyle is like when they get older, but is there a difference in how long a dog can work like does it vary from situation and and like for therapy dogs too, I'm curious about that as well, so. Uh, with therapy animals, again, it's really the um, responsibility of the human to really pay attention to the cues, to the behavior, to the health of that dog. So when my first um, uh, therapy dog, Abby, started again having issues with arthritis, that was time to retire her, right? Um, if she was uncomfortable, then that would not be a good time for her to be working. So she retired. But you know what? Schnauzers lived to be 15, 16 years old, so and she was in good health until she was like 13. So she did work. Um, so it's really the 
the human's responsibility to really, really advocate for their dog or pet, whatever it is that's going out doing therapy work, to really pay attention to the cues. Uh, is this still fun for you? Do you still want to do this? When I get out that therapy dog collar, do you still do circles around and want to jump in the car and want to go? Or do you just go and, you know, go back to bed? So, <laughs> uh, so really it's our responsibility uh, to provide humane care to our own therapy dog. Um, well, there are confounding variables because he does have Addison's, but I haven't really need knock on wood. This was the first winter that I didn't need tracks on my boots. And I, I really don't need him except to walk him. So he's, he's on the road to retirement. Okay. I think one factor that's really important too is what the specific tasks that the dog is doing would be. So a dog that's doing balance work where somebody is pushing down on them, um, arthritis would be an issue sooner than um, a dog that's potentially doing work that doesn't involve that level of physical task. And so what the particular tasks are is really part of the equation and how long they can work and how long that's sustainable. Eileen, do you have any comments to add? Um, just briefly that that's a decision that our graduates make. It, it's their service dog and yes, we're the resource for them, but they know the dog. They, they live with that dog every day and they are much they are a very, very strong advocate for their dog and doing what's right for their dog. And we trust their judgment. Okay. I think we have time for one more question. Are there certain breeds of uh, dogs that are better suited for this type of work and some that just would not be appropriate? <laughs> Anybody? Oh. I'm not a very good answer, positive answer behind that, but I will say I got a standard poodle because we have dog allergies in the house, and he was so easy to train, to shape his behavior it was so easy. I really never understood why he wasn't used more commonly, but then I tried to treat, train him to retrieve. Oh, my God. <laughs> and he really, I really have a poor recall. I'm not... not He's not a good choice. But. <laughs> well, there's no one set clear answer for therapy dogs, really. It has to be their temperament and the temperament of the human. Um, but in general, though, I'll say that if a dog appears to be scary to people, you probably should stay away from that breed, even though we know lots of lovely, kind pit bulls and, you know, you know the list. Um, but in general, though, if you're walking into a hospital or walking into a senior facility, uh, uh, you'd probably want a dog that appears more friendly. Now, that's, I'm generalizing because I have seen therapy dogs that are on that list. <laughs> so, But me personally, I chose a dog, and I did my research um, on a dog that did not shed. Because growing up on a farm, we always had big dogs that shed everywhere. They were always outside though. And they shed everywhere. And so I knew I wanted a small dog that did not shed that I could pick up and put easily on a hospital bed. Um, so, yeah. Okay. I would just add that it really partly depends on the particular tasks. That um, if you're using a dog for balance, they have to be big enough to be able to hold you up. Um, if you do a lot of air travel, a small dog is much easier to get in and out of a plane and you don't need an extra seat and um, so like all those factors of what the tasks are, what your life is like, what environments you're wanting to access are really important factors in figuring out what what breeds are most appropriate. Okay. Could I have one thing on uh, As a member of Assistance Dogs International one of the things that we're looking at on accreditation are standards that organizations have 
and the um, area of service dogs for veterans with post-traumatic stress disorder is kind of a growing, mushrooming area right now. And one of the things that we're discussing within that committee are standards and types of training that you do, breeds of dogs that are used because it's running the whole gamut. And so we're trying to accommodate a lot of different things. And one thing that you have to realize is that for someone that has uh, a veteran, and you know, I'm going to generalize again, and but a veteran that has post-traumatic stress disorder is more likely to have some issues around anger. And so training methods, you should probably keep in mind the type of training methods that you use so that you're using training methods that are not harsh, that are not physical. Um, and then you also sh might want, and again, it's, there was a big discussion, and, and because I don't think that we should define what breeds of dogs that you can use. But you also have to keep in mind that if, you're have, if someone has PTSD and they have anger issues and you're giving them a dog that is looked at as being aggressive, that may not be the right path to go down. And so there's going to be a lot of work going on within the industry regarding that. Um, and again, I think we're just kind of in that beginning phase right now with that. I think we could probably go on and on because it's such an interesting topic. I'd like to thank our panelists for being here today and sharing their wealth of information. <laughs> Thanks everybody for coming. And I'm about two minutes after three, so on this clock. Thanks everybody.